computer. All right, I guess, okay, we're recording. Now, I want to, let's begin with prayer, all right? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, we ask your mercy and your blessing and your grace. Um, because James is going to challenge us a lot in the things he says, and um, we need that challenge. Um, we also need your grace. So help us, Lord, to hear these uh, challenges as an invitation to receive your grace to accomplish them. And we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Now, one thing I want to say, um, a lot of people don't understand what I mean when I say this or what the church means, really, when she says this, that we are in an incarnational faith. The Christian faith is an incarnational faith. Now, the word incarnation refers to the fact that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, took to himself a human nature and became uh, incarnate in flesh. Literally, carnis is where we get the word like carnivore. It means meat or flesh. So uh, Christ took on flesh, our human nature, uh, to himself. And um, um, we could literally touch our God. Okay? Um, there's a tangible, touchable, physical dimension to the Lord coming among us. So this is when we say that our faith is incarnational. This is what we uh, are refer. This is what we mean by that word. Okay. Um, now, with that in mind, James is going to kind of hammer away at that idea. You know, about being doers of the word, not just hearers only. Uh, it's a very similar theme in First John, who constantly talks about. Whoever says he loves God and doesn't keep the commandments, you know, is a liar. Or, um, uh, you know, the way we can know that we love him is by keeping his commandments. And so there's a kind of um, a reality-based way of checking out um, your, um, you know, your, whether your faith is real or is just kind of lip service or some emotional thing that you've got going on or just an intellectual set of things. Or is it real? Does it take flesh in you? and your actions, and the way you live, uh, or is it just uh, on the pages of a book somewhere, or is it your grandmother's faith, you know, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, so uh, this is why, now we, let's, let's, let's just extend this idea for one more moment, and see that all the sacraments uh, are uh, in some way touch the body. Hmm? Um, so in baptism, we pour water. We don't just say, I consider you now baptized, little baby. Go away. Um, we don't just wave our hand or something. Uh, we actually pour water and we say the words. Uh, there, we touch the child with with anointings and 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 so on. So the body is touched uh, as well as the soul is is reached and affected. Uh, in in confirmation, we lay hands on and we anoint. Uh, in Eucharist, of course, we receive physically ta or tangibly the body of Christ. Um, um, it's not just some, you know, vague remembrance of him. We literally go up and receive him, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So, um, or, so we, he not only touches our body, he comes into our body and is assimilated and becomes part of our body and we become part of his body. Uh, likewise, again, um, you know, in confession, there's a laying out of hands. Now, sometimes it's not a physical on the head because you're behind the screen, but there is this thing. And people say, well, can I have confession over the telephone? And the answer is no, because the sacraments are incarnational. And likewise, can I get communion by, by mail? No, you've got to schlep your body to church and be part of a, a gathered community of, of fellow believers. Um, you know, we go to now like the sacrament of holy orders. Of course, the priest's hands are anointed, but he has hands laid on him by the bishop and his hands are anointed and so on. And then finally in marriage, we tell the couple to join their hands and, and declare their consent. Um, so all of these are ways of saying there's a physicality to all the sacraments. The sacraments somehow touch us, and the liturgy also appeals to us with, through things like bells and incense and music. Uh, the body is engaged. We have different postures. We stand, sit, we kneel. Um, we're, um, we're not just engaged in an intellectual study, but we're engaged in the physical or worship of God with our body, and our soul, our voice, our heart, our mind, our whole self, you see? Um, so, um, again, um, there is this, um, um, physicality that's part of particularly the Catholic and the ancient faith, the Orthodox, the Catholics, 
all of us who are ancient faiths. What you start to find, though, in the 16th century with the rise of the Protestant churches is they moved away from a lot of this. Um, there was a lot less standing, sitting, kneeling, incense, bells. Uh, sacraments became more uh, symbolic. Um, they really reduced the number basically to one, maybe baptism. Holy Communion was more of just a, a kind of a memorial meal. Um, they only did it maybe once a month. And so they moved away from a lot of this. And of course, all the other things that we see in the Catholic churches for sight and sound, the, the stained glass, the high ceilings, the paintings, the, the statues, just everything meant to, you know, call out it's a sermon in stone and glass. So our faith literally becomes part of the physical world around us. It's literally manifested. It becomes flesh in the way we talk and move and, and so on. And so you're going to see that a lot of this stuff comes up in James today, and it's also a very common theme in the letters of John, okay? And all right, so with that in mind, um, would someone like to read tonight if we, we did maybe verses 22 to 25? I will. In the first chapter, okay, go ahead. Let me get that. Oh, she's not there. Uh, 22? Through 25? 25, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he, what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Okay, now, um, I, I think the, um, the, the, the image he has here is complicated. Um, we, the, what he, the first point he makes is very clear. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And we talked last week, I think, about this word deceive. It comes up a lot in James and some of the others. The word deceived means to be literally in the Greek and the Latin rooms, uh, like the cheptus means to be picked up and carried off. Um, and so the image is like you're, you're a little rabbit in the mouth of a wolf, you know, and you're being picked up and carried off to his lair where he's going to kill you and eat you. <laughs> so deception is not good. <laughs> it's a very uh, dangerous physical, it's a very physical, even a violent word to be picked up and carried off. And so to be deceived, it means to be picked up from where we should be with the truth and carried off to some area of darkness and falsity uh, where our enemy, Satan, uh, is and lives, okay? So we also see then that um, um, we can also, though, deceive ourselves, you see? It's not just that we can be deceived, but we can uh, deceive ourselves. And um, most people think that just means, you know, um, lie to ourselves. But if you think of the image of being carried away, you've heard sometimes people say to you, stop getting so carried away. You know, in other words, we can lose our way through uh, excessive emotional things. Uh, now, I'm not going to say that this is true of anybody here, but, you know, sometimes we did some foolish, stupid things when we was in love. <laughs> and uh, love, love uh, breaks every rule sometimes, you see. But, but, but again, uh, other emotions, sometimes anger carries. We get carried away with our anger. Uh, things carry us away and we, get, we, sort of, uh, we sort of get out of our religion, so to speak. We lose our religion over it. Uh, and uh, maybe not permanently, but we, we wander off and um, we lose our way very quickly when, when heavy emotions take place. Or sometimes we entertain, you know, foolish theories or ideas that are not of God. Um, and we listen to too much stinking thinking. And we don't have enough of, of biblical truth uh, to kind of clean our brain out. And we start to think, um, you know, false things. Or we start to th think... The bigger form of it today is that we we start to think that a lot of things that God calls sin are no big deal. So you and you have typical standard fare in these movies where people are engaged in all kinds of illicit sexual union. They use foul language. Violence seems to be the solution to everything. Um, there's also now portrayed homosexual acts and different things in these movies and things and the music we listen to. I mean, I can't believe some of the lyrics of the music I listened to growing up. You know, I, I was, we didn't pay that much attention to the lyrics, thank God, but 
some pretty bad stuff. And, and we start to uh, immerse ourselves in a culture that just makes light of or winks at faults and thinks that all this, all this talk about morality and, and stuff is no big deal and come on and uh, God doesn't care if I sleep with my girlfriend and, you know, all these kinds of attitudes. And so we get picked up and carried away um, with worldly notions. We just, we just are so immersed in it. We just get used to it and we get comfortable with it. Okay. Um, St. Augustine also talks about the power of addiction. I think I'm quoting him from the city of God that uh, basically he says that, um, um, uh, that um, um, bad behavior became common and common things became habitual and habit not resisted uh, became slavery, you know? So uh, the, um, uh, this, th these are ways that we deceive ourselves, okay? Um, we tell ourselves little lies. It's not that big a deal. It's not that much. It's okay. Everyone else is doing it. How come I can't have it? Um, you know, the church is you know, down on this or that, you know, and, and so instead of uh, really immersing ourselves, we listen to the, to the lies and to the distortions of the world, which if it doesn't just outright deny our teachings, uh, does say that, um, oh, come on, it's not that big of a deal. And we make light of it. Okay. So, um, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So, again, um, all of us imperfectly do the word that we hear. So we, are all, we all know this is a human problem. But there are some who take it to the point where they're almost living a double life. They're saying they're a Christian, but they're not living like a Christian at all. Um, and this happens a lot of times when, you know, funerals are planned, you know, where you know, someone wants to be buried out of this church and we don't know who they are. Well, I used to be here back when my great grandmother and, and old St. Cyprian's day and, uh, you know, and, you know, haven't, you know, they, they, they fell away and they haven't really been going to church and, you know, but they want the full Christian funeral. And of course, we're going to give it to them. But the point is that, again, um, they just fall away from the faith, even though they call themselves a Catholic. Well, Father, he prayed or he read the Bible or whatever. He said, OK, but. You know, did they go to mass? Did they serve the poor? Did they, you know, repent of their sins? Did they go to confession? The things that we're expected to do were not really part of their life. So again, um, I'm not anybody's judge, but I'm just going to say that a lot of times we're confronted with um, people who don't, uh, you know, all of us are going to fall short to some degree. But I hope that at least for the bare minimum that, in, that most of us are trying to get to mass, repent of our sins, um, Come to Bible studies yeah. like this and, and hear, hear a word from God um, and, and things like that. So I think we want to uh, say that uh, we, we have a range here. So we have just the things that we, out of weakness, don't always perfectly live. But then we also have the situations where um, the um, people are just outright living a double life. You know, um, we, I, we had that sad story last uh, week about... Uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., who's, uh, you know, the son of Jerry Falwell and the president of uh, Liberty University, who, um, well, let's just say he was living kind of a double life, um, kind of a, a sexually depraved life, uh, while all the while, you know, demanding, you know, pretending to be straight-laced Christian preacher and uh, running a university that insists that the students be chased and so on. So, and... Um, that's kind of, I don't know how some people can live such a double life. We've certainly seen the problem with priests who abuse and bishops as well. Um, I don't know how they sleep at night, you know, living just complete double lives, you see. So that's at the other extreme. We have the little things by weakness that we fail to live perfectly, the word that we profess. And then we have some middle range things um, where um, we, uh, we're still sort of culturally Catholic, but we don't do most of the basic things. And then we have other people that are just outright living double lives. And so there's a whole range here, you see, right? And um, so now um, it says here for, if now this is where this, this is a complicated image, okay? So for if anyone's like, hear the word not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and forgets what he was like. Now that's, that may seem like an odd thing, um, but what what what, he, what James is really getting at here, I think, um, and um, some of the commentaries and the church fathers agree on this, is that 
when you habitually do something, it's part of your very nature. Um, and it's hard to forget uh, what, what you're to do and what you believe. But when you just pay lip service and you don't really live or do the word and don't have habits that help you to do that, it's like somebody who looks into a mirror and just uh, goes away, forgets what they look like, or meets a stranger, sees their face, but goes away and forgets what they look like. Um, the reason he does is look in a mirror is because this is an internal thing. So um, do I remember what I look like? You know, most of us do, but remember mirrors weren't that common in the ancient world, good mirrors anyway. And um, the, um, you, you could find a good mirror and look at yourself, oh, that's what I look like, okay, and then go away and just kind of forget. Um, um, but do, do you follow the basic point? That is to say that there is a, uh, an internal sense of oneself that one has, and to the degree that we habitually live the faith, um, that, that's, that living the faith is part of that essential sense of ourself. It, we're, we're, it's, it's a habitual way of being. It's something that we don't easily forget to pray or to go to church. Or, or that we should be uh, caring for the poor, or living chastely, or, 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 or whatever, you see. Uh, so uh, we're not easily forgetful of what we're to look like and be like. All right, did you follow? Okay. And then it goes on to sort of say, um, uh, but the one who looks into the perfect law, uh, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, uh, uh, who forgets, but a doer, uh, he will be blessed in his doing. So, in other words, to develop good habits or virtues, uh, or virtue, there's an old saying that virtue is its own reward. Uh, uh, good habits bring blessings. Uh, good virtues, which are good habits, bring blessings. We know that vices bring burdens. Uh, they bring everything from addiction to, uh, bro you know, we were spending too much money or disease or um, life-changing things, you know, um, uh, like, you know, uh, where we, in anger, we get into a fight and kill somebody and we're in jail. So you start to see that vice brings lots of effects or consequences, but so does virtue. Uh, if, if, we, if we have good habits, um, we, we now have a new abilities, uh, we're blessed, um, we have, um, um, we, we are, there are many blessings that come from living soberly and temperately and chastely in this life. Um, that we, we avoid a whole host of suffering and troubles if we, if we follow this way, you see. Now, even though knowing that, a lot of people aren't interested, you know. Um, you can, but it's nice to sleep the sleep of the just. You sleep a lot better at night if you don't go around lying and living a double life and um, having lots of enemies who have it in for you. Um, you live a, a much better life if you're not paying alimony to your three wives uh, and uh, child support to your seven children by those three wives. And, you know, uh, you, your, your whole income is depleted and, you know, your life is crazy and you've ruined other lives. Uh, life gets very messy very fast if we go the direction of vice, but it also it has many, many blessings if we go the direction of, of, uh, of living, uh, being doers of the word. Um, God's word is for us a medicine. It's a peace plan. It's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a health plan, if you will, you know, for us. And, um, uh, if we, if we follow it and to the degree that we do, we're going to experience blessings, not a, not a struggle free life. We do live in paradise lost, but it's, our life is going to be a lot. E it's going to be a lot easier to live our faith and our life becomes easier and filled with more blessings. Maybe not as much wealth or power or popularity, but our life is a lot simpler and we're not doing all that crazy stuff that I told you earlier, okay? So do you follow the basic point, right? So it's not just an admonition, be doers of the word, not hearers only, but he reminds us that it's a real blessing to do the word um, and that we ought to uh, joyfully pursue this instruction to be doers, not just hearers of the word only, okay? All right, um, by the way, I don't think we, um, we, I, I think I, I accidentally skipped those verses just above, 19 through um, 21. Would you read those? Could you, um, uh, Mackie here, let me see if I can, okay, you can unmute, okay, good. All right, 19. Yeah, right. All right. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man, does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. Most of us have that backwards, right? <laughs> I'm a big talker, right? Uh, you know, I, I had an, there, there's something cultural, though, I think, too, uh, that goes on with this. I noticed that um, on the East Coast here, in the Northeast, we, we talk in a very back and forth, kind of almost interruptive way. That's kind of our way. But I went out to the Midwest, say, I was up in North Dakota, probably about mid-state. And, I, you know, at first, the people there seemed like they're a little slow, I mean, mentally slow. Because uh, I'd be talking like a typical Eastern, and they just be going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. And um, I thought, well, don't they have anything to add? Don't they have anything to say? And um, uh, I, I came to discover that no, they had they had plenty to say, but they were just waiting for me. They list, they were they were just listening to me, and then they would make a response. You know, well, you're, you're from uh, Washington, there, aren't you? And I said, yeah. I said, well, that that's just uh, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> So uh, they're not like they're without opinions or whatever, but uh, they're doing they're this rapid going back and forth sort of talking. Um, I think part of the way we show enthusiasm is that we interact with each other rapidly. So it's not always the case that we should just sit there and listen and listen and wait till a person stops to speak. But I think that the, the, main, the main thing is much more spiritual. We, we are very often quick to say, oh, that's just awful. And we don't even know all the facts yet. Um, or to uh, you know just uh, uh, you know say say something or believe something about somebody, without really getting all the uh, data or the information or verifying it. Um, so and we run around and share stuff and we gossip and it's just uh, uh, we have very little real information or or not enough. And uh, so the per the point is to do a lot more listening and a lot less talking, or at least a lot more listening before we talk, would be very important um, because. Very often, you know, I think it was uh, Chesterton and Fulton Sheen loved to quote it. He says, it is not Christianity that has been tried, uh, tried and found wanting. It's just that Christianity has never been tried. And most people are rejecting the not the Catholic faith, but some caricature of the Catholic faith. Uh, and if they would come and discover more about it, they would find its beauty and that these things fit together and that there are actually explanations, you know, for the things that trouble the world about our teachings. So anyway, uh, this is typical, um, and we can be that way about other groups or other people as well. Um, instead of trying to find out what they are really saying or whatever, we just sort of qu quickly react, sum it up, and either reject it or accept it, you know. And um, so that's the, uh, the danger that we live in. But it says here, and, um, and slow to speak and slow to anger. Now, Okay, so let's talk, I know, I know some of you have heard me on this before, but some of our, our newer members uh, from out of town maybe haven't. When we talk about anger, we have to be careful um, to understand that not all anger is sinful. Uh, the Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. You may notice if you open up the gospels that Jesus was angry, quite a lot actually. You know, not just when he cleansed the temple, but I mean, he had a lot of angry invective with uh, uh, with people, and not just the scribes and Pharisees. You know, at one point he turned on his uh, apostles and says, how much longer must I tolerate you? You know, um, or he says, are you so slow to believe? Do you still not understand? You know, he would, he would get exasperated with them. Um, or another time, you know, with the, this time with the Pharisees, you know, he said to them, he said, I have much to condemn you for, but I say only that which my father has told me to say. But I tell you this, that unless you come to believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And, and he says, and he goes on to say to them, um, how are you to avoid being sentenced to hell? Oh, you scribes, you, you, Pharisees, you scribes, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers. Now, this is like, whoa, you know. And in our culture, this would be considered um, highly offensive, and um, we're sort of we're sort of dainty, you know. We don't like name calling and stuff like that. And um, I, look, I'm not going to say what's right or wrong. I'm just going to say that some cultures tolerate a lot more of this sort of angry type of talk than others. Uh, I, I dated an Italian girl once, and uh, she and her mom. <laughs> I don't know what they were saying. And um, uh, ten seconds later, just you know. They were, they were fine, you know, whereas in my house, if we'd had an angry thing like that, we'd be bent out of shape for weeks, you know, 
So there, there are different ways of, um, if you go up to New Jersey and New York, you know, uh, you know, bump, uh, get out of the way, man. You know, that kind of very, uh, you know, very brash kind of talking uh, that, that goes on. And um, uh, so anyway, that's uh, um, the, um, so there's a lot of cultural dimensions to the expression of anger or in the moment. And um, so we have to see that there's, there's a bit of a cultural dimension to Jesus' anger. But what I'm trying to mainly say to you here is this, that there is such a thing as righteous anger. And then there's unrighteous anger. Now, St. Thomas in the Summa distinguishes unrighteous and righteous anger by, first of all, their, uh, by, the, by their object, and then secondly, by the, by the degree. So uh, if I'm angry at, let's say, racial injustice or something, that's a righteous anger, right? Uh, if I'm angry at any injustice, I see. There's a certain righteousness to the anger. Now, but even if my anger is righteous, the mode or the degree of it has to be moderated so that I would only use the amount of anger necessary. Um, and I, um, so um, throwing rocks and bricks and rioting and breaking things is not acceptable. Um, the, um, uh, one of the masterpieces of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's approach was that um, he was able to take the righteous anger of people and turn it into an energy, a creative energy. See, anger is like an energy. It signals us that something is wrong and delivers the energy to deal with it. So uh, sometimes that's a physical threat. Uh, or sometimes it's just that our values are being threatened or people we love are being threatened and hurt and harmed. And so we have an in indignation. So what he said to them is, hold on to that anger, but don't vent it. I mean, like yell and scream or stuff it and let it become depression. Let it become action. And that's where they began to do the sit-ins, where they resisted evil laws where they uh, were willing to get arrested um, and spend a night in jail. They were willing to endure being spat upon, having hot coffee poured on them. You know, you got to, at some point, you got to be angry enough to be willing to do that, you know, but not this yelling and screaming anger, but this, this nonviolent um, resistance to evil, you see. And um, that's, that's a form of righteous anger, both in terms of its object and its mode or its degree, okay? Uh, unrighteous anger would have a, a, um, an Ill illegitimate or a petty object, you know. So, for example, um, uh, I stole something and then someone stole it from me and I'm angry. <laughs> or um, just, you know, someone someone called me out of my name or they didn't give me the proper respect or, you know, or someone got, you know, favored instead of me. You know, those are petty and, and less uh, significant things, you see. And so... Uh, we wouldn't necessarily label that as righteous anger. That's more of a petty anger. And then there are times where some people are actually angered at goodness. Um, and they become envious and angry and they seek to destroy that which is good. Uh, so, uh, and again, in unrighteous anger, the mode is less important. It's just wrong. Okay. Now, Obviously here, James is talking about unrighteous anger. We just, you know, we're going back and forth and we're doing a lot of talking and not a lot of listening and we're getting ticked off at people and suddenly we're getting angry. And um, uh, so we don't have here uh, a righteous anger um, that he's describing. It says here, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Uh, so again, th this is obviously definitionally not a righteous anger, it's unrighteous. Um, and um, we... Well, you heard the first reading from last Sunday's Mass. Wrath and anger are hateful things. And we've got a lot of that today in our culture. You know, a lot of clenched fists and back and forth and different political parties, political invective. It's, a, it's very overheated these days um, and uh, very disrespectful. Um, uh, I could go on and on. Um, but we're really quite at the boiling point, I think, in this country. And uh, it's, it's very, very overheated. And... Um, what of that is righteous and what of it is not righteous, you know? Um, I'm going to guess that most of it, because of the fruits, which are bad, uh, are, is unrighteous. <laughs> and um, we have to be very careful because anger is a very dangerous emotion. It can be, a, it's a beautiful thing. It can be, like I said, like Dr. King could, it can be channeled into something very beautiful. Um, but um, our, 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 our anger is unruly. And we need to be very sober about that. And we need to try our very best to curb it when it first begins to arise. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Let me clarify. Did I hear you say what I think I heard? Let me, let me make sure I understood what you said. Could you repeat that? So we don't just immediately, you know, react. Or 
Well, let me be sure that I have all the facts here before I go off the deep end and, you know, I, someone has to talk me off the, uh, the ledge. Uh, let me find out um, if, if all this information is true. Uh, did this person really say that? What was the context? You know, but too easily, we just read a headline and we go, yeah, you know, and we, we get angry. And we don't really read the context. And we, uh, we forget um, to, um, uh, that we don't always have as much information as we think we do and so on. So again, it says here that um, uh, we must be slow to anger. So there's a place for anger, uh, but we must be slow to it. Be very careful. Uh, much of our anger is not righteous or it's at least less than fully righteous. And we have to be very careful and sober about it. Okay. Now, as you know, some people have done and said things in anger that they can never take back. They have sometimes said things that they can never unsay. Uh, they sometimes cause harm that they can never undo. Maybe they get involved in, you know, dangerous striving or uh, they, they, uh, they get into a fight or they, they, uh, they cause property damage. I don't know, any number of things, you know. Um, that's we all know that our anger can be a very volatile thing. Okay. So um, just do a couple more comments and I want to hear from you. Um, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. It's interesting. He uses the word meekness here. Um, the word meek in English is, is a kind of a weak word. It, 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 most people think it implies somebody who's kind of a, uh, easily manipulated, uh, who's um, uh, kind of a, um, you know, like, well, let's just say easy, easily manipulated, kind of a doormat or what have you. But that's not what it means at all. The Greek word here is prootes. And it means, it, it, was, it was Aristotle defined this word that we translate meekness as the proper middle ground between too much anger and not enough anger. Now, um, so in other words, meekness is the virtue wherein, wherein we govern our anger. We have authority over our anger, okay? So you can see that meekness is actually a, a very strong virtue. And, and those who can really have authority over their anger are, are, have, are, are strong indeed. And uh, many people struggle to have real authority over their anger. It consumes them. Even if they don't yell and scream, they can't sleep and they toss and they turn and, you know, all these kinds of things. But the meek are able to have authority over their anger and uh, have have proper degrees of anger where necessary. Notice again, the middle ground between too much anger and notice not enough anger, because there are some things that we should be angry about. We should care about, you see. Now, why would he apply this word meekness then to, to receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls? Well, I have found that there is again this very mm, balanced spot little range of area where anger at the foolishness of this world inspires me to listen to the word of God. Okay. Um, and, um, some people say, well, why do you write so much? Because I'm angry. <laughs> but it's like a zeal that I, I want to get God's word out there. I want to get people to think about things differently. Uh, I want to try to influence people with the word of God. And that's why I preach. That's why I teach. That's why I write. Because I'm, that's not the only reason, because I'm angry. Um, but uh, there's a kind of a zeal uh, and an anger when I see how confused and how dark the world is and how confused so many people have become about even the most basic things, like am I male or female? That's really confused. And it makes me angry. And I want to uh, preach on this. And so uh, as you've heard me say sometimes, in the pulpit, I, my, 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 my beloved people, I love you too much to lie to you. There are not 50 genders. There's only male, there's only two sexes, male and female, he made them. The Bible says we come in two kinds. God made us male and female. Everything else is a lie. Okay. And I got four people to get up and walk out on me. <laughs> and you know, there's a little anger behind that, but not so much anger that I'm just shaking my fist and screaming and calling people names. And, and so we want to find that good middle ground where we have a certain anger or a zeal, maybe to put it in a more positive way. Um, we want to hear from God because we're upset about the condition of the world, right? 
And um, we want to receive it with a zeal and excitement that says, there are answers to all this darkness. There is light in this darkness. And I, I'm excited and zealous and I'm angry about the darkness. And, and so uh, now I can receive with meekness this proper middle ground between too, not enough anger and too much anger, right? Because, you know, if I'm not really angry about the world, I'm not going to worry too much. I'm going to just sit in juleps and watch TV and why bother studying the word of God? Why bother reflecting on God? You know, man, who cares? You know, everything's fine as far as I can see, you know. Uh, it's not very motivating, you know, to be like that, you know. And so there's a kind of a fine center there that we call, you know, St. St. Thomas said that the virtue always stands in the middle. So um, we want to uh, realize that there is a proper anger that we should have, and there's an improper anger. And finding that sweet spot is the virtue we call meekness. Okay. I want to make sure that guys, I've laid a lot out there and I haven't heard much from you all yet. So, by the way, uh, anyone new like Seth and Kyle, always feel free to just unmute and ask a question. We don't have to wait till I ask for questions. That, that's true for everybody, okay? But are there some things that we should discuss or clarify or do you have any reflections so far? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> okay. We're all perfectly clear here, right? Okay. All right, well, I'll go on to do a little more teaching. He says something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. I have a question about the line, put away all filthiness and rank growth of wickedness and yeah. receive the meekness of implanted word. Yeah. You know, so, there's so much filthiness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look up the Greek words here. Just a minute. I'm opening up my Greek text, okay? Hang on a second. This is James 1 and verse um, 21, right? 1. Oops. Uh, oops. Come on. One of these medicines I'm taking makes my hand shake, and it's hard to type. Okay. James 1, 21. Okay. All right. Now, um, I'm just going to go to the Greek here. Hang on, all right. Therefore, having put aside all filthiness. Now, right, par, right, parian, right, parian, see. Um, yeah, hmm, interesting. Yeah, it, 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 it just, it's just the ordinary word for filth or pollution or defilement. Um, but it's most, it's, uh, according to the, the Greek dictionary here, it's often used to refer to the moral filth that desecrates the soul, okay? Yeah, that's exactly, you know, I'm taking it for what, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't watch a simple sitcom. Yeah. And you, you really enjoy the show. I mean, it has a nice, nice mm -hmm. show. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there's two um, males or two females yeah. Engaging in immoral behavior right in the middle of the show. Right. Like that's necessary for the plot. Come on yeah. now. Right, right, right. Why yeah. does that is necessary for every plot? You don't see the heterosexuals have engaging in behavior. Um you, don't? you uh -oh. can't watch anything anymore. No, no, right. I like a good murder mystery. Yeah. Yeah. I like a good detective story, something that's going to challenge my mind to figure out what's going on. Yeah. But no, you can't watch anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say, Liz, generally I don't. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I've, um, uh, I, I, I used to watch a lot of movies, but I got away from them for two reasons, the violence and the uh, illicit sexual union. Yeah. So... By the way, you know the other the other words are properly translated too. You know, kakaya meaning the meaning evil or wickedness, malice or spite. Huh? So uh, put put away these things. Now you notice again, what does put away mean? You know, well for some of us it means turn off your cable. Now, you know, some years ago, I'm talking a long time ago now, um, back you know twenty some years ago, uh, I, I began to realize that HBO and Showtime had porn. You know, on late at night, and uh, I. Uh, I was a, I was, you know, I was a very uh, a much younger man at the time, and uh, 
I couldn't take that. And I said, even an older man, I'm not going to take it. But I think the, um, so I just canceled HBO and Showtime. Oh, but father, there's a lot of good stuff on there. I know it's not worth, it's not worth endangering my, my chastity and my soul, uh, having that stuff available to me at the flip of a button. Um, like any of you, I, I have careful things set up on my computer. Thank God I don't have an issue with uh, internet porn, but, uh, but I, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't trust myself so much that I don't keep the filters pretty heavily, uh, you know, going. Um, if I, so as I say, I, uh, it's not an issue, but uh, I don't want it to become one. So again, as I say, it's somewhere along the line. Yeah. Um, we, we always want, we want to be able to avoid evil without any cost. And we can't, um, we're going to find that we're going to miss a lot of good stuff, you know, and trying to avoid the bad stuff. And there are some prudential judgments to be made, you know, um, Sometimes you can find cleaner versions of these movies where some of the, maybe they move, put it on TV and they remove some of the profanities and other things. But um, a lot of times you're just going to have to say, that's just not something that uh, is part of my life. And frankly, I don't miss it that much. I don't miss television that much. I don't miss going to the movies and things like that. Now, look, there's, there are good movies out there. Don't get me wrong. And I'll, I'll, if somebody really recommends something highly to me, you know, I certainly will, you know, watch it. But the, I have to be, be sure before that it's not was filled with those kinds of things. So I agree with you. I, think, I think the reason the reason why I brought it up is because when I do my RCIA classes and I have these young mm -hmm. young adult, uh, um, people coming in the classes, mm -hmm. it's um it's important to be able to have a dialogue with them to help them understand um things that is what is considered to be normal or things is considered to be, you know, routine uh, in, in uh, everyday life is, is not correct. Yeah. And just because it's a, it's a part of uh, what, what you see in the everyday storyline and, and all that. And, and it seems like it, it's an yeah. absolute must in yeah. every kind of story. Um, doesn't make it right. right yeah. It doesn't make it um, correct as a part of your yeah. moral judgment. And sure. you shouldn't allow your kids, you shouldn't allow um, your family members to make you think that that is something acceptable mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've gotten some knockdown, drag out discussions with individuals that I told them if they ever put that kind of thing in my face again, we were going to have to part ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, I, I think we're, we're, we're pretty agreed on this. I will say this much is it's, um, you know, the, the, I, we were talking the other day on morning glory that my the radio show I'm on about the Netflix is one of their latest things is to have these little girls. We're talking, like eight, nine, ten years of age, you know, pardon the expression, but quite literally shake their booties and, uh, you know, do lots of uh, simulated sex acts and things like that. And uh, that this is uh, somehow acceptable. And so, I mean, I canceled Netflix a long time ago, y'all, when they presented Jesus as a gay man. Um, mm -hmm. I just canceled. I said, that's enough. We're done here. Uh, but Father, there's a lot of good stuff on there. I know. But at some point. Now, I'm not saying all of you have to make that same decision. I'm just yes. saying that at some point we have to say, I cannot let my soul continue to be defiled. Uh, I have to put this away. I have to put it away. And um, that's, uh, I, uh, I'm maybe a little harder on myself than some of you would be, but I would just simply say that uh, um, that's what this text is saying. You know, that uh, elsewhere, Jesus says, if your eye is your problem, gouge it out. Well, don't literally gut out your eye, but if your cable is your problem, cut the cable. <laughs> You know, if the music you're listening to is, you know, it's your problem, cut the cable, you know, uh, if your alcohol is your problem, you know, throw away the bottle. I mean, but you, you see the idea we have to somehow make a break. We have to be willing to make a break with things um, that uh, that are harmful. Uh, and not all things are harmful to all people, but some things are harmful to all people like pornography or being a constantly exposed and desensitized to illicit sexual union and things like that. So we'll leave it at that. But I mean, that's what the text is saying. And it, there is a cost and we have to be willing to accept that. Right, right. Be free and easy and it isn't. 
Right, right. Okay, other thoughts or comments? Um, I have a question. Both you and Ms. Liz um, kind of mentioned everything I was thinking and I was trying to form the question. Looking from the outside in and from a personal experience, how can you give support to someone when you're religious, but they don't practice it, but they believe in it and they need to walk away from a situation? For example, um, when you have a married couple and there's infidelity and because of cultural reasons, the person doesn't believe in divorce. However, trying to interpret the scripture, I know I can't give my input, but how can I kind of make them think or have them do the research of maybe you really need to part ways, even though it may go against your religion, but just to listen and just oblige by what we're studying tonight, as well as forgiving like 77 times infinity or whatever the case may be. Like, how can you balance that where you just want to do right? Not so much of me being an outsider, but want the other person to kind of come to that conclusion for themselves of what's right for them, but also honoring their religion and their Christianity, as well as anything else that gives them moral integrity that is righteous looking from the outside in, if that yeah, question well, makes even, sense. I don't, I don't know that I would advise anybody to get a divorce, um, uh, like in the case that you're talking about. Now, there are going to be times where, um, let's say there's physical abuse going on, you know, and uh, you might have to advise that there be a separation. Um, but I, I would never be the sort to say, you need to go divorce that person. However, as I did say in church on Sunday, forgiveness doesn't mean that we just go on being abused. Uh, there are just going to be times where there are people in our life who cause such trouble and abuse that we have to keep boundaries. We have to keep distance with them. And that doesn't mean that we're not forgiving of them. We just know that right now, for whatever, you know, a number of reasons, we're not able to live in peace with them. And, um, we have to keep our distance, but uh, the, the forgiveness would involve not holding lots of hatred and vengeful anger and so on, hoping that they drop dead and things like that. Um, and we give the rest to God and say, Lord, you saw everything and I'm going to ask you to handle this now. And so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of uh, many couples where there is, uh, there's been unfortunately infidelity, but their marriage survives. Uh, they're able to forgive each other um, and um, whatever forgiveness is needed and they go on. Other couples haven't been so able to do that, but I never say you should divorce them. I just say, well, um, if there needs to be a temporary medicinal separation and so on, maybe that's important. Now, every now and again, someone will come to me and say, well, we, I had to get divorced because he was taking all the money and I had to be legally separated, you know, and, you know, but the church doesn't recognize divorce. Um, uh, there can be annulments, and I, I don't want to get into annulments tonight. That's, that takes too long. But um, I don't know. But I'm just not going to say that I would ever be saying you should divorce them. I might have to say in cases where there's grave abuse, maybe you need to separate for a while. And let's see if maybe that'll get him or her to her their senses, and you can um, get back together or whatever. But um, does that make sense, Ava? Eva? Yeah. Eva? Yes. Yes. Eva? Yes, ma'am. The um, as a friend, my first um, counsel would just to be to try to help her um, take care of herself. Uh, you know, most most women, you know, uh, have issues thinking everything is their fault. Um, that something's wrong with them. They need to. The first step is take care of herself. And um, you know, maybe get some counseling, and um, then try to get some marriage counseling, um, and try to you know resolve their their personal problems because they have a lot. You know, most times they have a lot of people telling them what's wrong with their relationship, mm -hmm. and they haven't tried to work on it with somebody that understands their faith. And, and help them understand each other. Um, but, you know, 
if, if you are, if you as a woman are thinking that everything is your fault and everything is something is wrong with you, then naturally um, you, you're going to sit in a corner somewhere and suffer. Okay. Now, well. you know, so, so first things, you know, get some help and, and, and get somebody to un, who understands your faith and get some counseling, marriage counseling. Mm-hmm. You know, that's as a friend, that's what I would offer. I certainly wouldn't tell her that she needs to get a divorce right away without trying to work on herself and work on her marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think that's about all we can do, you know, with yeah. um, with that for now. But um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people in a lot of difficult situations, especially today, where we don't live in a a world where shared values are as common. You know, some of us who are older remember there was a time in America when, at least with most basic moral issues, we had basic agreement, um, but that's no longer true. And um, um, I'm not saying that it was a perfect world. I'm not saying that there weren't things that we overlooked. I'm just saying that as a general norm, we, um, we, um, we had more agreement on these things and it's very hard today. So, all right. Now let's go down to verse uh, 26 uh, and read just to just verse 26 um, because I think it's kind of separated from verse 27. So okay. you want to read that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Yeah. Religion- well- Strong word, huh? No, we'll, we'll, we'll just stop just that one verse. Uh, so that person's religion is worthless if they don't bridle their tongue. Um, now, um, um, first of all, um, what it, to bridle something? Anyone r- r- ride horses? Um, you know, to bridle, you know, basically means it's the way you, you control a horse. You know, there's a bit in the mouth, but there's a, uh, you, you pull on the, the reins or the, these leather straps and the horse knows to move to the right or the left or to stop. Uh, so the a horse is trained in this way. So this is again, an image then for our tongue. There is a time to speak and there's a time to stay silent. Uh, there is a time to, um, uh, but, 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 you know, so, so often we're halfway through a sentence before we're even thinking about what we're saying if we're not careful. And um, we're revealing things that we shouldn't reveal, maybe confidential matters, or we're, uh, we're, detra- we're engaging in detraction. That's to say we're pointing out maybe a person's known faults. Um, and um, the, um, we have lots of... Um, um, yes, I wish I could yes. say hi, and I was in oh. that just now. Oh, Did so. you miss me? Your internet is unstable. Mute, mute. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Um, so, any rate, the uh, uh, so, but anyway, the bridle means to control. So, you know, uh, it's it's a. Um, he's going to talk more about this later. <laughs> if anyone can control their tongue, they're they're truly a strong a strong person. Uh, the to- the tongue, though a small member, like a like a little spark, can set an entire forest on fire. <laughs> One wagging tongue can set an entire forest on fire. Uh, uh, and so we, we, we know that one of our greatest gifts is the gift of speech. And with it, we can edify, we can teach, we can proclaim the truth, we can console, we can encourage, and we can also say the most hateful, awful things. It is uh, awesome, awesome um, how uh, awful we, you know, some of the things that we can say and do are. And one of the tragic things is, you know, um, we can say things that we can never unsay. You can't unring that bell. And uh, you can say something that's so hurtful and so hateful that it can never really be taken back. Um, or someone catches you in an unguarded moment and you're saying something on a live mic. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, it's a very, um, you know, a very, very um, devastating things can happen to your own reputation. Uh, let alone um, other things, you know. So, any rate, um, let me just um, give you some. I, I want to just give you some. Um, what you might we might call some more common misuses of the tongue. You know, there's there's the lying tongue and there's the flattering tongue. 
the proud tongue, the overused tongue. Um, for, for example, from the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, a fool's voice comes along with a multitude of words. <laughs> There's the swift tongue, speaking before we should, right? The backbiting tongue, you know, talking about others behind their backs. The tail-bearing tongue, spreading unnecessary, often hurtful information about others, right? Tail-bearing. Uh, the cursing tongue, wishing that harm comes to others, usually that they be damned. Um, uh, so, you know, GDU, you know, that kind of stuff. And the piercing tongue, where we speak with unnecessary harshness and severity. The silent tongue, not speaking up when we should speak up, we, when we ought to warn people of sin or other things like that. So again, our, um, our speech is riddled with uh, lots of possible sinful things. And yet we can also, um, I think, um, we can also, you know, say beautiful things and consoling things and healing things. And so this is why bridling the tongue becomes a very important thing. Um, and as James points out later in this letter, it's one of the last things that many people master. You know, it's just a very difficult thing, you know, and I think part of it again is like I was saying earlier, there's this kind of social pressure to banter back and forth um, to, um, you know, to be actively involved in a conversation back and forth. And it's part of belonging to the group or the conversation. And we just get going and talking and talking and, and it makes us seem and feel enthusiastic. And, um, and so we get all worked up, but we stop reflecting. What are we talking about here? Should we be talking about it? Is this edifying? Is this helpful? Okay. And it's easy for me to sit here and say all this right now, you know, but like tomorrow when I get together with four or five priest buddies for lunch, you know, who will we serve up in, in, in addition to the, um, <laughs> in addition to the food, <laughs> who's really on the menu. Uh, and, you know, it's just very easy to, you know, ban you know, banter back and forth about what's going on in the diocese. And do you hear what so-and-so, you know, it's very easy to do all that. So, I don't know. This is a tough one, y'all. Um, yeah, it's a bridle of the tongue. So we'll look at that. He's going to develop this more later. Um, go ahead um, and just read the last verse there, 27. Right. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. <clears throat> okay. Well, now, again, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but he's giving key examples that undefiled religion. Now, orphans and widows were just another name of saying the poor um, in Jewish times. Um, orphans and widows were the poorest of the poor because, unfortunately, in that culture, really to have any financial support, you needed a man in your life, a uh, father or a, a husband, uh, in some cases, a brother could step in, you know, and so on. But um, widows and orphans uh, were some uh, among some of the poorest. And if for some reason they weren't blessed with a large family and they become a widow and there's no son to take care of them, uh, they became quite destitute. And um, there was great uh, mention all throughout the Old Testament that both widows and orphans uh, re needed special care. And um, uh, this, that the community needed to be serious about taking care of them. All right. So, uh, but in other words, uh, he, so he's basically saying visiting the poor and keeping oneself unstained from the world. Now, again, we've already talked a lot about this, you know, keeping oneself unstained from the world. Again, it, 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 when we, remember two weeks ago, we did that little uh, section on the mind and I talked to you about this a little bit then, you know, it's astonishing what we will expose ourselves to, you know, without thinking, you know, just staring at it and, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, we'll almost listen to anything, look at anything. We'll almost uh, just expose ourselves to anything. What, what kind of reverence and respect do we have for our mind that we would sully it with a lot of stuff, you know, like that? Um, and to also then to flip the coin that we don't spend more time with the word of God or with he healthy, good and wholesome things that build us up and edify us and confirm us in the faith so that, that we're more um, deeply devoted to, to the things of God. Um, 
So what, it's what we don't do and what we do. It's, it, it's astonishing. We will look at really trashy stuff for a long, long time. Now, again, our mind is like a sponge. And don't kid yourself. If you put a sponge in muddy water, it's coming out muddy. Oh, well, I can look at that stuff. It doesn't affect me. Hmm. You know, little by little, these things, even if they're just mild, like we were talking about earlier, they start to desensitize us. Things that we used to find shocking, we no longer find shocking. Um, uh, just the, you know, the, the use of God's name and profanity, you know, shocking, you know, but uh, no longer are we easily shocked or we start to see things in movies and television and other things, you know, presentations or in the music or other pop culture or even the Super Bowl where some half naked woman is up there singing, I forget her name, um, you know, and we're just like, hey man, this is like cool. No, it isn't. This is sinful, and this is leading people to become desensitized to things that ought not be revealed. And um, this is not the purpose of a woman's body that her butt be in the in the screen for while she while she shakes it. That is not the purpose of a derriere, a derriere. <laughs> Pardon the expression. Um, and it's you know, in other words, it, it's it's stuff that would 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 have shocked people 50, 60 years ago, and now it's like, you know, big whoop, you know. And so what I'm trying to say is that um, um, we, we have to, if you will, keep ourselves unstained from the world. Now, I'm not asking everyone to become a prude or to become completely isolated and totally unplugged. M most of us have some obligation to stay in touch with the news and other things that are going on. And Liz was saying to have some awareness of what's going on, what our kids really are hearing out there. But I would be careful uh, to only do what you necessarily need to look at to be informed. Um, and be, you know, have some respect for your mind and your heart and your soul. And um, there are a lot of things that are just unfit for a Christian to be exposed to or to be involved in. And um, they, uh, they, they bring us down, they sully us. They, uh, as it says here, they, it, it, it's, we're stained or sullied by the world. And um, I think a lot of us, I don't mean everybody here, but I'm just talking collectively, uh, could, could afford to be a lot more careful about what we're looking at and listening to and more selective and be willing, if necessary, to pull the plug on some of these things like I did with Netflix and, of course, earlier with HBO, Showtime. I don't have time to watch all those movies anyway, uh, let alone the stuff that came, came on late at night. But at the end of the day, um, I don't feel deprived. I feel like I, I would rather pray or uh, go over to the church and play the organ or study or write and, and be with you anyway, you know? And so little by little, the Lord also converts our desires, you know? So he doesn't leave us bereft and like biting our knuckles. Gee, I, I can't watch my favorite shows on Netflix anymore, you know? Um, well, go buy some DVDs of them or something or find some other streaming service that's not giving you all kinds of pollution so that you can watch Car 54 and not, but but you don't have to also have that pollution of you know gay Jesus and little girls, ten year old girls dancing half naked on a stage, you know. Um, so there's other ways you can you know find Car Fifty Four out there if that's your favorite show. Okay, um, some of the younger ones here won't know what that is, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I've I've said enough, I think. But how about some comments or questions on this because we're gonna. Uh, we, we'll make a decision whether to wrap up for tonight, or maybe we'll do a few verses for the next chapter. But let's let's see if you have some comments or questions. I had some thoughts, Monsignor. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this idea here about a religion that is pure and undefiled. Mm. Uh, I mean, I I think that the way that James is putting this forward is just really masterfully because he's he's kind of bringing back what we've already just been talking about. Um, mm -hmm. especially, uh, towards, you know, verses 19 through 21, that segment there, um, mm -hmm. get rid of, uh, therefore rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, um, uh, and welcome with meekness, the implanted word that mm -hmm. has, uh, the power to save your souls. Um, that idea, I mean, it's just, that's that right there, um, mm -hmm. being able to, to welcome that implanted word, that word that the Lord desires to place within your heart, that grace, that power, um, is really the prescription in many ways, not only to be able to uh, reject and put away 
the darkness of this broken and fallen world, but to be able to live into this calling towards true religion. Yes. Um, and then kind of moving forward, you know, as you point out for us, you know, you know, be doers of that word, not, not just allowing it to kind of sit, to stay, mm -hmm. but true religion actually gets up, moves, is, uh, takes that which has been implanted uh, and actualizes upon it. Um, and so I was looking a little bit at just some uh, of the original language here at, for that word doer. It's really interesting because uh, the, the word there, it can be doer, maker. Other ways to use that word is even poet. Um, and so it's kind of like be a poet, with mm -hmm. that word which has been implanted upon your heart. Yes. You know, be able to be one who proclaims that word, mm. the Holy Spirit, the grace that you have been given um, to everyone with every means at your disposal and do that beautifully. Yeah. Uh, in a way, because what does the poet do? He doesn't just kind of, you know, go out into the world, just kind of like, you know, that, put, that, out, that. put out, yeah. you know, jump, but he's putting out, the beauty. And so in being able to be a person who is actualizing upon that true religion, mm -hmm. um, we can kind of be that poet um, that can share that word that's been implanted within us. I think it's a, a really just kind of masterful thing that James is kind of weaving for us here. Yeah. That's an excellent insight. You know, the, um, um, and, it's always helpful to, you know, when you have a minute to, you know, if you have any capacity at all to look at the Greek text and uh, because again, so many of these Greek words really do have, you know, so much, um, so much more variety or depth to them than sometimes they're able to translate into the English, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> so the, um, um, see, yeah, po yeah. In fact, the Greek, the, Greek, the Greek word is, in fact, uh, poetai, right? Which is where we get the word poetry, right? So, and that's interesting. How, how does the word religion uh, translate from the Greek? Let's see here. Um, I'm looking at my Greek text. Uh, oh, what verse is that in? Uh, that was in uh, 27. Yeah, so. Reli religious is in 26 and religion is yeah. 27. Triskia, um, see, yeah, religion, the underlying sense of reverence, worship of the God oh, and worship. So, um, it's um, well, threskos is the uh, is is the is the is the Greek word for religion. So, I don't, sometimes for worship, threskos, but I don't see any really nuances that that you know jump out. Uh, just to me, the uh, you know, the, in Acts we talk about the way, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. and just religion has always been more stilted to me. Uh, it's just kind of a, okay. Well, I would I would like to push back on that a little bit because I don't the Greek the Greek it doesn't but in the Latin re, religion religi, religere means to be held fa, fa, fast or bound by cords. Um, now, what I like to think of therefore as the, the, I think the word religion is very beautiful because they're cords of love, mm -hmm. uh, like a mother will wrap a child in swaddling clothes. Or, uh, but God wraps us tight and holds us close to Him. Uh, so to be bound fast or held close by God in an embrace is how I see the word religion, and I think it's beautiful. But you're right; a lot of people just say, "Hey, man, I'm spiritual, not religious." Right. And and they're, what they, they they hear the word religion to mean institutional religion, uh, some you know big body or group of believers, and like I'm above all that man, I'm superior, you know like uh, so. Um, but anyway, I think that it's 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 to misunderstand a beautiful beautiful word, you know. There's a, some of us who are in the parish here know the old gospel song. I almost let go. I was right at the end of a breakthrough, but couldn't see it. The devil really had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me, and he held me close so I wouldn't let go. <laughs> yeah? Well, so thank he, you. That, that explains it to me. I, I yeah. hadn't heard that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think religion in the Latin is a beautiful uh, meaning. And unfortunately, it's been discarded by a lot of people as, a, as an old, ugly word. And I think that's just a real shame because the whole idea is that I want God to hold me close and I want to well, I want to hold close to him. Religiosity is somewhat of a pejorative type term, I think. So I think that's I'm kind of sadly. Yes. Yeah. But again, basically, it's basic meaning means to be bound by cords of love. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. All right. Any other observations? Wow. Or, um, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's usually that was about to say, it wouldn't make sense to go into chapter two tonight. So we'll start wrapping up. But I would say that um, you see here that in a way, th this, this book of James is almost more of a collection of sayings. It's almost like we're reading Proverbs by James. Um, and one verse doesn't necessarily flow directly to the next verse and so on. Um, but um, it's, uh, they're all very helpful and they, they, and they're also very, uh, he can be tough on us. You know, if you don't bribe your tongue, your religion is worthless, worthless. Wow. That's a strong, that's a strong term. I mean, um, pow. And he's, he's, um, but when you think about it, some of the greatest harm that we can do is with our tongue. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I, I'll just say, I speak in a very general way because I hear confessions, not just here all over the diocese, 33 years of priest, I've heard lots of confessions. And I can say to you that I think people have a lot of shame about certain sins, like mostly sins of the flesh. So eating too much, drinking too much and, and sexual matters. And good. I, I mean, so, you know, having some, compunction about those sins is important but you know would that we had the same kind of shame about the stuff that comes out of our mouth all day long or the stuff that doesn't come out of our mouth all day long you know um so it's, it's interesting that certain sins we're easily shamed about other ones we don't seem to be that concerned about um and uh well i'm just outspoken you just make excuses well uh, that's just that's just my personality no it's all it's, it's, it's your sin <laughs> You know, uh, now, now, you know, it's not wrong to, always, to ever be outspoken, but you understand the point I'm making. People, people just sort of, you know, well, he knows how to call a spade a spade. Well, maybe he shouldn't. You know, uh, maybe uh, we could find um, a way to listen more and be a little kinder. Um, even just little things like uh, giving, giving people their proper titles. Like it's very common today to refer to politicians just by their last name, you know. Um, you know, so uh, uh, Trump this or Obama that, you know, instead of President Trump or President Obama or Speaker Pelosi or uh, you, you see what I'm saying? It's just simple ways of showing the respect for the office, even if we don't agree with the person on all their policies, you know, uh, human respect, uh, proper human, uh, properly understood to be respectful, give people their proper titles. Um, not simply excoriate them. Um, and um, again, some of the ways that we, we, in our political speech is just way off the chain. And Catholics should not be speaking this way about people in authority, even if we have vigorous disagreement with them. We, we should express that without personally attacking them, you know, and um, this is, but this is, of course, people feel so right, so right in doing it, you know. <laughs> And um, it's, it's, uh, it's something that isn't that right. You know, look how Jesus acted, you know, before uh, Pilate, you know, he didn't yell and call him names. He does say to him, look, you would have no authority over me unless, you know, you, you were given it by God, but he admits he has authority over me at this moment. Um, um, you know, he did call Herod a fox once. Go tell that fox. <laughs> <laughs> but that could almost be a compliment. <laughs> But anyway, the point is that uh, a lot of the, um, the, the ways that we speak, uh, you know, it's an easy example with the politics, but even in family settings and things like this, we, we can be just um, insufferable. And all I, all I would ask you is to, is to ponder how strong James puts this. He says, sins of speech can render your whole religion just kind of worthless. Um, you know, because you, you say you have faith and look, you're running your mouth just bringing people down and uh you say you love god and you say you love man and you don't you don't sound that way you know so again it's uh it's very strong very strong and it's it's meant to get us to think about something that we often make light of well i said what i said you know 
There's an old expression you've heard me say before. Say what you mean and mean what you say, but don't say it mean. Right? And there's a lot of just meanness out there today, especially in, in the public square now. And, and um, yeah. In Monsignor? Mm hmm what is does it mean when it says but he who looks into the perfect law the law of liberty and, and perseveres what laws what are they talking about god's law certainly and it's called the law of liberty because um you know the, the true liberty is to obey god the um um the catechism is very interesting in the way, way it puts it it says that um that uh, true liberty is the capacity to obey God. And Jesus says, um, the truth will set you free, you see, so that um, lies and deceptions enslave us, but the truth sets us free. So this is why it's called the law of liberty, okay? Um, it's, um, um, the Jews objected and said, we are slaves of no one, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but he, he goes on and rebukes them. And he says, um, if, if, you know, he, he says, I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life. And if you come to the sun, he will set you free. Um, and they, they object. Right, uh, my translation says the, the perfect law of freedom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, you know, saying something very similar that it, the, the paradox is that, to obey God, to become a slave of God, is to become truly free. Now, I know that we object to that word slave, but that is what the Greek text, you know, doulos, is often translated now servant, uh, but it really means slave, and it's meant to be provocative and very paradoxical, that, that to become the slave of God is to become truly free, okay? Now, the paradox comes from the fact that, look, let's all be clear, we're very tiny, we're little tiny little specks floating on a slightly larger speck in the immensity of space. And um, we're going to obey someone. It, no, might as well, was... it might as well be God who loves us. You know, one second, one second. Uh, it, it, we're going to obey someone, whether it's the culture or Satan or the man or, who, or the, the jailer. <laughs> but if we, we're going to obey someone. It might as well be God who loves us and knows what we're made for. When I read it, I was thinking, you know, it's like Christ's fulfillment of the uh, Old Testament. And, and so it was like the law of liberty, uh, the perfect law. So it's like Christ's coming and what Christ was teaching us. This, I kind of looked at it like that, but I wasn't sure. But anyway, um, like the uh, beatitude. And you shall know the truth and the truth. Like will something like truth. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Well, listen, it's time to wrap up. Um, so we'll go into James chapter two, starting uh, with, uh, next week. Um, and um, thank you for attending. Let's, let's say a prayer. <clears throat> Um, we thank you, Lord, for uh, a time together, and um, uh, that this this word. Um, well, we've all we all probably have something we'll especially take away today. Um, so help us, Lord, to remember specifically what you want us to remember. Something to take away and and ponder and work on, and um, help us to remember that our faith ultimately is to become flesh in us. That is, uh, it takes root in our actions, our decisions. The way we the way we move about and what we do and what we choose to do and not to do and how we choose to speak and not to speak and so all of these Lord uh, all these things we ask in your mercy and your grace and we ask you to help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only through Christ our Lord Amen. All right, y'all, you can unmute and say bye. All right, bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed one. Take care, 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 everybody. Have, have a good night. night. Hi, Kathleen. 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 Hi,